for, um, there we go. All right, so good evening, everyone. For everyone who's just joining us at the beginning of Birder Chat, um, and welcome to the um, this evening's February um, 2021 um, Space Coast Audubon um, General Meeting. Um, so we're, we just finished a little bird chat and heard some updates related to what's going on as far as local sightings. Um, I'll have to say that Jim hopefully will be with us in just a minute. We'll get a refuge update from him from the Mare Island National Wildlife Refuge. Um, and um, but let's just talk about what we um, are going to go over today. So we've had a little bit of social time. We maybe have a few more minutes. Just a couple more people are joining. Uh, we've got a couple of chapter business updates to cover with you. I'm going to be turning over to Bert um, shortly, our field trip director, to do that. Um, and after that, I'm going to share some highlights about what's coming up for the next couple of meetings. And um, for those of you who might not have been with us last month, we have, as a board, made a decision based on guidance from National Audubon to remain in virtual format for our meetings um, until May or beyond. So the rest of the things that we're going to be offering you as far as the monthly general meetings will be in virtual format, and I'll be sharing with you who our speakers are for those. Um, at that point, I'll introduce our amazing speaker tonight. He's got a very special announcement, and I'd like to say I'm pretty sure this is true, and hopefully Anna will correct me. You're going to hear it here first. <laughs> the first people to get an announcement related to Orlando Wetlands, so stay glued to your, to your screen. And then after that, you've, some of you have seen on Meetup that we had a special prize opportunity going along. Um, and Bert's going to lead us through um, some folks who, who, um, who might be winning that prize. Um, so um, I don't, let me just take a double check to see if, um, if jo Jim has joined us yet. I don't think he did. So in that case, um, so Jim, our president, will be joining us, I think, later. Um, but I am officially calling the meeting to order. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rochelle Hood. I serve you all as your vice president for the chapter, among a couple different roles that I have. So thank you for joining us. I think we have a couple guests this evening. So thank you for coming and trying us out. It's nice to have everyone here. Um, and on that note, let me turn over to Bert, our field trip director. Um, to talk a little bit about what we've just experienced and a couple of people mentioned in their bird or chat updates, the Great Backyard Bird Count. What, would you like to report on, on that, Bert? Yeah, I actually want to go over a few of the um, past events we've had because a few of them are still going on, but the Great Backyard Bird Count uh, was a lot of fun for me. I hope everyone else enjoyed it. Um, I, I got to see several great black back gulls when I was down at uh, Paradise Beach Park on Monday and uh, one of them flew right over my head and it's amazing how big that bird is but uh, <laughs> it, it's it's a lot of fun and um, along with the GBBC I also um, put out for everyone the eBird Essentials uh, video course and that is uh, always available so anyone that didn't get a chance to do it uh, last weekend uh, you can go in at any time and watch the eBird Essentials. It's a free video on uh, how best to uh, use eBird. And then, of course, we give uh, eBird training classes, and I'm always willing to help people when we're out on our field trips with how to use eBird to the extent that I know it. David's always teaching me something new, too. Um, most recently, we just had the Creating a home Homegrown National Park uh, webinar and I hope I know a few uh, people had the opportunity to uh, key into that one and then we also had the Brevard County's Keystone um, species and native bee plants and um, I'm not sure how many people were able to attend that one I was there it was good okay very good excellent I was impressed <laughs> <laughs> Pat and I were exchanging text messages on, in that one welcome Pat <laughs> Speaking of Pat, um, Pat's been leading the uh, a lot of the maintenance of the Auto Space Coast Audubon Garden that's at 100 Acre Hollows, and so we had uh, a work day on February 7th, and we've got another one coming up this Sunday, February 21st. I'll talk more about that in a minute, uh, but please get out there and, and uh, give, give Pat a hand and help with a little bit of the weeding and all the other she, she's been doing an excellent job out there. Um, we also went to Oakland Nature Preserve. So that's a, a little bit further away for us out, out in Orange County. Uh, it was new for a lot of people. So I was glad we got out there. 
unfortunately, we didn't get to see the sparrows that I was hoping to see. And then when we went over to Newton Park, uh, the the bronze cowbird wasn't over there. So kind of struck out on those, but uh, the purple gallinals were beautiful at, at Newton. And we saw well over 30 species at, at Oakland. I think it may have been over 40 species. I thought that was a great trip too. It was yeah. kind of far, but it, it was a wonderful place to see birds. It was good. Yes, thank you. And the park, I saw, we saw four purple gallinal. Yeah, they're, they're fantastic. Uh -huh. I also uh, put out an opportunity for the oyster reef uh, supply prep for the Brevard Zoo. So I attended that on January 18th. And they still have a lot of uh, different opportunities. Uh, that one was on a Monday, so a lot of people weren't able to go, but uh, they have some coming up on the weekend. So if you go to, the, if you're interested in that, you can go to the Brevard Zoo uh, website under the conservation department and uh, learn a little bit more about that. And then we did Chain of Lakes, another uh, great opportunity up there in Titusville. We saw quite a few birds, and uh, it, it's a, a just a nice area to go for a walk, if nothing else. And then another reminder is anyone that didn't sign up for the Space Coast Birding Wildlife Festival, it was virtual this year, they're still doing replays. So if you hadn't signed up, but uh, want to still see the videos, you can still sign up and, and watch those. There, there is a charge for that though. And uh, so you want to look for that. So that's what I've got on a lot of the past events. I don't know if uh, anyone else has any comments on some of those past events that they'd like to bring up. Okay, then uh, we can go to the upcoming events, Rochelle. So with the uh, upcoming events, tomorrow is uh, uh, Oak, Oak and actually it's Oak and Palm Hammock uh, Trail. And it's, uh, we're, we're full. We, I've got um, uh, Mark Wallace is going to be helping lead the second group. Um, we've been having so many people show up. Our, our wait list is almost as big as the number of people that get to go. And I, I apologize for those that uh, aren't able to make it, but please try to sign up as uh, quickly as possible. And, and uh, uh, then also don't be disappointed if you're on the wait list because it's amazing how just a day or two before the event a lot of people you know events come other events come up and they have to drop out and those people that were on the wait list get moved up uh, i think at oakland we had uh, everybody move up off, off the wait list. that was me i was like the ninth one on the wait list and you let me know i could come so that was good yeah we we'll have a lot of activity tonight <laughs> Yeah, and if you got any questions about it, you can always give me a call the night before and I can let you know if I heard someone making a last minute uh, uh, cancellation because sometimes it doesn't show up on me. Meet up, uh, uh, um, once again, also with the, for those that are going tomorrow, because it's been, been raining, it might be a little muddy uh, and wet. So just be cautious of that and please bring bug spray um, if you're, um, affected by the bugs uh, too much. Um, the next event we've got coming up is on Sunday and that's another work day in the hollow. So that's where uh, uh, we can get out there and, and uh, help Pat. That's the, the very bottom bolt you see on the chart there. And uh, that's actually gonna be from two to four. We, we change that time. I don't know if you saw that Pat, but um, to make it uh, work in conjunction with the sunset in the hollows that immediately follows uh, the workday. And then next weekend, we're going to do Turkey Creek Sanctuary. And because we've been having so many people signing up for these events, I was able to get uh, three trip leaders to help out. And so we can have up to 30 participants and three leaders on uh, that activity. So, um, uh, Kate is going to be the, the lead for that, Kate Wells, and then uh, Susan Petraco and Bill Haddad are, are going to help with that. I'm going to be out of town, so I won't be at that one. And then on March 13th, uh, Orlando Wetlands Park, uh, Mark Wallace is, going, is the leader for that one, and I'm, I'll probably be out there helping him, and uh, we may hear some more about Orlando Wetlands Park a little bit later today. And then uh, not on this, this list, but is on meetup is a virtual um, 
Winds and Wetlands. It's uh, actually a, a virtual event from Kansas. So we thought it would be interesting for people to have an opportunity to see a birding festival in a, a state uh, that's not near us. And so you can kind of see a little bit about what they're doing um, to improve things for the birds, the types of birds that they see and so forth. And then on uh, March 28th, we're going to go to Jetty Park and uh, see what, what we can find there in the down by the beach, then walking through that hammock. We, we have, last time I was there uh, with Val, we did see some uh, uh, painted muntings. So. Are there any questions on any of the field trips or activities we've got coming up? Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Bert. And and I'm sorry that I misspelled trail and it says trial, but it didn't come up in spell check because it's an actual word. So uh, you're no one's on trial and everyone gets to go out along the trail. So enjoy that. Um, all right. Well, let's hear about what's coming up as far as meetings go. Um, so as many of you know, because you're repeat folks, and um, we have been trying to, since most of us can't travel um, or travel the way we like to right now, where I've been trying to travel for you by going around the world, getting you some interesting speakers from places that we can't yet go to. So we started that series with Costa Rica. We continued on to Alaska. We went to Papua New Guinea. Um, and now we're going to go next month to Peru. Um, sort of, I'm going to say courtesy of Matt and Laura, because we're actually going to enjoy the guide that they, along with Angie from our group, all got to, um, to go um, birding with some time ago. Um, that also is going to include a, a, an interesting, I'll just give some teasers, as you know, I like to do, COVID-related spin that ended up in an amazing condor um, project. So they're going to spend a little bit of time at the end of that talking about an update related to that and how that relates to a positive outcome of COVID. Um, then we're going to continue on in bird in Panama. Um, so we'll do that in April at the April meeting. And, and then to wrap up the, this birding season's virtual meetings, um, we are going to have an update from Eagle Watch. So we have a number of people who currently participate, some that have participated in the past. And I'll have to say this birding season, that's uh, probably been the most number of touch points I've had with the Audubon Center, Audubon Center for the Birds of Prey, because we've had just a number of notes of people, I guess, from being home and stuff, um, you know, asking about assistance with all sorts of things, or they've seen a nest and they want to know if it's monitored. So I thought, why not bring that information to you firsthand? So we're going to have an update related to all of that project, how we can be involved in some of the data outcomes, and that'll be happening at the May meeting. Um, so with that out of the way, let's learn about Purple Martins. Let's learn more about Purple Martins. So um, while you can see all of Anna's um, and background and bio here, what I really like to say about her she and I had some interesting discussions during the dry run. Um, and she was like, oh, Rochelle, I'm just so excited. I'm back to doing birds again, because she's had a long journey with some frogs and some turtles and some other things that she has done. But that love of birds is there, and she's returned to that. Um, and she'll give you a little bit of a background about her journey getting there, and then give you our wonderful information, including that special announcement I've talked about. So I'll stop sharing, and I will welcome to the digital stage here, um, Anna, who will go through a little bit more background and, and tell us all we need to know about Purple Martins. Anna, over to you. Thank you, Rochelle. All right, let me share my screen here and make sure that I share the right one <laughs> so you don't have to see my email. <laughs> uh, here we go. And full screen. Can everyone see that okay? Good to go. All right, perfect. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm so excited to be here to talk to you at Purple Martins, although I wish I could be there in person and meet you all in person, but hopefully we'll have the chance to do that uh, at some point in the future. So uh, as uh, Rochelle said, I am at UCF. I am a uh, research faculty at UCF and I've been here since 2016. And I study a whole bunch of different things, uh, including Purple Martins which we'll be talking about to you uh, about today. But I also study turtles and frogs and manatees. Uh, and specifically, I'm really interested in understanding the microbiome or the bacteria that live in and, and around, in, on, and around these different animals. 
All right. So before we get started talking about Purple Martins, I thought I would tell you a little bit about myself since we haven't met before. Uh, I'm not actually from the United States originally. I am from Sweden. Uh, both my parents are Swedish and uh, we moved to the United States for the first time when I was six months old. And then we moved back and forth several times um, until I was 11. And I've been in the United States since I was 11. My parents are both very outdoorsy people. I spent my uh, summers growing up sailing in the Baltic Sea and spent a lot of time outdoors. And that definitely cultivated the love of nature for me. And um, here's a picture of me, I guess I was four or five holding a frog, a toad, it's a toad. And uh, when I was a kid and even up until my teenage years, um, I was pretty sure that I wanted to study their toads or, or frogs. I was really into amphibians. But then I went off to college. Uh, I went to college in Williamsburg, Virginia, at the College of William and Mary, and that's when I discovered birds. So I had the opportunity to do an undergraduate research project that really changed my whole world. <laughs> and I realized that uh, I wanted to study birds and I wanted to go on to grad school and eventually become a professor so that I would have the ability to continue studying these creatures and to work with students. Uh, I had a really great uh, experience as an undergraduate researcher and that's really stuck with me. And so I'm really excited here at UCF that I have the opportunity to work with a lot of um, great undergraduates. I have a lab full of really enthusiastic, wonderful students. Um, so I finished up at William and Mary and decided to take some time off before graduate school. And I ended up at Dartmouth College up in New Hampshire. And I worked at the medical school there for two years. And you may be wondering, what are you doing at a medical school? You've just told us that you want to study birds and want to be out in the field. Uh, well, I decided that I needed to do something different before going to graduate school. And I had not had a lot of lab experience. And so I took this job um, to, uh, to learn something new, to learn a new skill that turned out to, again, really make a big impression on me and had a big effect on my trajectory going forward. So. This is sort of where genetics and genomics entered into my life while I was at Dartmouth. When I finished up at Dartmouth, I continued on to Illinois State in Normal, Illinois, and worked with Charlie Thompson on house wrens. And this project that I worked on there focused on looking at uh, different types of benefits from extra pair paternity in, uh, in the house wren. Uh, so about 30% of nests in, uh, for house wrens have these extra pair young that were sired by some other male other than the social male. And so we wanted to try to figure out why this was happening and whether those offspring were of better quality uh, in some sort of way. So I have a lot of information on that. That's not what I'm gonna talk about talk to you about today, but I'd be more than happy to come back and talk uh, about house friends at some other time. So I finished up at Illinois State and then had the great fortune to end up at Cornell University, where I did my PhD work, uh, spent a lot of time at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology there. So uh, wonderful place to be if you're interested in birds. Uh, there I studied tree swallows and uh, together I applied all of these different ideas that had sort of accumulated in my brain over the years uh, and I started studying the bacteria that live in the nests of tree swallows and how those bacterial communities influence the immune system development and the immune response in these birds. So I finished up there in 2016 and uh, left Ithaca and ended up in sunny Florida here at the University of Central Florida. And I was hired originally by the university to start up the genomics lab for the biology department, uh, which I did. And I run that lab and I also teach genomics. Uh, I also teach ornithology now. And I conduct research um, within my own lab group and also in collaboration with a lot of other groups. So my own personal study systems are the Purple Martin and uh, the Florida Scrub Jay. However, I have lots of collaborations with other folks in the biology department. So I'm also studying uh, frogs and toads and uh, sea turtles. Um, I have a wonderful undergraduate student who has been working with me for several years now looking at um, the diet of sea turtles and specifically using uh, genetic techniques to figure out, figure out what these sea turtles are eating. 
I also study manatees, which we talked about earlier uh, before the talk. And there we're looking at the microbiome, uh, both the gut microbiome and also the skin microbiome. And a new project that I'm working on with the Eastern Cottontail, the New England Cottontail and the Eastern Cottontail looking at a diet uh, collaboration with some folks up north, which is really exciting. So I have a lot of varied interests. Uh, and so it's really exciting to be in a position where I can pursue a lot of them. So I thought I would include some pictures so you can see what my, well, my pre-COVID daily life looks like. So this is what the genomics lab looks like in the Department of Biology at UCF. This is where I teach the genomics course for undergraduate students uh, and also where I conduct a lot of my research. So lots of fancy equipment in here uh, where a lot of the action happens. Uh, in my group. So I just want to take a moment and uh, stop here and clarify what exactly do I mean by genomics. So I like to define genomics by actually comparing it to genetics. So genetics is the study of one or two genes and how they're inherited and how they influence the way that we look and the way that we act. Um, the uh, genomics, on the other hand, is the study of the entire genome, and the genome is the collection of all the genes that you have. Um, so instead of just focusing on one or, and one or two genes at a time, you're actually focusing on all the genes and how those genes are working together and which ones are expressed and which ones are not expressed. And I, what I mean by expressed is being turned on or not being turned on. Um, so that's what genomics is. And we've been able to, we are able to do genomics now because of DNA sequencing that allows us to sequence the entire genome, like the Human Genome Project, for example, to look at the entire organismal blueprint. Uh, another thing we can do is uh, something called transcriptomics, where we're looking at not the entire genome, but the portions of the genome that are turned on at any one given time. And then my personal favorite is the microbiome. So this is using genomic techniques, so sequencing to understand which uh, microbes are present in any one community at any one given time based on that genomic blueprint that they have that we can sequence. So I consider myself to be a molecular ecologist, uh, which means that I use molecular techniques focusing on DNA to understand ecology, uh, specifically of birds. So how birds interact with each other and interact with their environment. So for both short, the short term, so ecological time and over evolutionary time. So over long periods of time and how populations are changing. And we can get at a lot of these, uh, the answers to these questions by using molecular techniques. So this really combines my original love for birds that I discovered as an undergraduate and also those laboratory skills that I developed um, during that time that I took off um, before going to grad school. So the, the main thrust of my own research uh, for my research group at UCF is understanding the interactions between mic microbes in the environment and their hosts. Uh, a lot of these questions pertain to birds, but as I said, I work with a lot of other systems too. So I'm just using a bird here as, uh, as an example. But there are lots of interactions between hosts and the microorganisms in their environments, um, either that live directly on those organisms or inside them. Um, and we, we tend to think of microorganisms as being negative or being parasitic or having negative effects on their hosts. But it turns out that isn't really the case. That's not the whole story. And so when we think about the gut microbiome, for example, we've learned uh, for humans and for all other organisms that have a gut microbiome that these microbes are actually incredibly important to our well-being. And so if you think we have about a pound or so of bacteria in our gut, which maybe doesn't sound all that appealing, but if you didn't have those microbes, you would be a very, very sick <laughs> individual because uh, we actually need those microbes to derive nutrients from the food that we consume. So I'm really interested in how these different microbes uh, affect our health and well-being and how the immune system functions. So that's sort of an overall view of sort of my research questions and I specifically use birds to, to answer these types of questions. So 
let me step back now and and uh, make way for the main star of uh, tonight's talk and that of course is the purple martin um and uh, the purple martin is a swallow and so belongs to the family hirundinidae which is a large family of birds uh, and it has about eight 80 species worldwide. Some of them are very widely distributed. So this is um, a range map of the barn swallow, for example. And uh, many of these species, including the barn swallow, do have subspecies, as does the purple martin. So about 80 species worldwide, uh, but in the Americas, we have about 29 species. Uh, of these 29 species, the purple martin is the largest of the swallows and uh, purple martins are migratory. So they breed here in North America in our summertime and then migrate down to South America in our fall and into the winter. <laughs> so purple martins are, the wingspan is about the size of a standard bowling pin and uh, they're about between 45 and 60 grams in weight depending on the, on the subspecies. They're sexually dimorphic, which means that the males and females look different from each other. And they also have delayed plumage maturation, which is more obvious in the males. So the bird that we see here on the right is an after second year male, meaning that it is now the second season that this uh, second season or after that this male is returning to um, the breeding grounds. So during uh, the first time that a male returns to a breeding ground, um, he will look more similar to a female. A female is what we have here on the left. There is delayed plumage maturation in females as well, but it is uh, not as obvious it is, as it is for the males. Purple martins are aerial insectivores, which means that they eat ins insects and specifically do so on the wing. So they, they uh, forage while they're flying and purple martins also tend to do so at very high um, altitudes. I've included some pictures down here. Uh, purple martins are known for, for uh, really favoring the big juicy dragonflies. Uh, this guy over here has got a moth and we'll see a little bit later in the talk that um, we've learned from our work at UCF that in fact they do eat quite a few different moth species. So purple martins lay uh, between three and six eggs in general uh, and females will incubate, incubate those eggs for a, a bit over two weeks. And their nests uh, usually consists of this, we've got pine straw. So this is a nest that's probably been supplemented by a purple martin landlord here. Um, otherwise we'll see small grasses or sticks. And then the birds will tend to lie, line these nests with uh, green and uh, dried brown leaves before they start laying their eggs. <laughs> Once the chicks hatch, they will be in the nest for about 30 days. Um, and so these are actually some pictures that we took this last year at UCF. Um, so these are some, some chicks that had just hatched out and here they're on the left, they're getting ready to fledge. And by this time, the nest is very, very dirty. Uh, when they're young like this, um, the adults are very good at keeping the nests clean. So they'll carry out those fecal sacs and deposit them outside of the, the nest to keep them, keep them clean. So there are three, three subspecies of the purple martins. The ones that we have here in Florida is the Eastern purple martin. Uh, on the West Coast, we have the Western purple martin. And then, um, oh, I included a picture here too. I thought this was really cool. So uh, on the Eastern purple martin, uh, the Eastern purple martins uh, use artificial nests very, very extensively. And so they've started doing this for the Western purple martin as well. And they look a little bit different, but uh, they've been having good success on the West as well. So I, I liked um, this one. So this is from the Olympic Peninsula Audubon Society. They have a, a project out there to provide nest uh, nesting cavities for the West and purple martin. And then the third uh, uh, subspecies is the desert purple martin. This is, uh, although I'm biased with the eastern purple martin, the uh, desert purple martin is probably my favorite. Uh, these guys are super cool. They're also smaller. Uh, and Excuse me, Anna, yeah. I'm having trouble seeing the pictures, your pictures of the purple martins. Oh no, is it not showing up? That's right. Uh, I see, oh. I see other participants. Okay, so, 
Um, Nancy Jo, let me have uh, Megan work with you because the slides are sure. showing. So it might be that you have your uh, yours in um, gallery view versus speaker view. Uh, okay. So Megan, would you mind helping her in chat while we continue Thanks. on? Thanks. Do you want me to pause or do you want me to? Uh, we all see them well, so I think if that's okay, um, Nancy Joe, are you okay if we, all right. Um, Perfect. Yes, well, then you. we will continue on with the Desert Purple Martin here. Um, so these guys, the smallest subspecies of the Purple Martin, they are super cool, I think. They uh, nest in the saguaro cacti. And uh, like the other subspecies, they are colonial, so they like to nest in um, close proximity to each other. And if this is of interest to you, I definitely suggest that you check out to the Tucson Audubon Society. They have lots of information and they have been working on a project here over the last couple of years uh, where they are monitoring these guys and using um, endoscopy to actually be able to get in there to look at the birds inside the cavities. So um, I recently saw a talk from the Tucson Audubon Society that was great and I'm guessing that they probably also post those videos. So if this is of interest to you, I definitely suggest that you check it out that they are very, very cool indeed. So as I said, we have the Eastern Purple Martin here in Florida. Uh, they are, uh, like all Purple Martins, colonial nesters, which means that they like to nest in large groups like this. Um, the Eastern Purple Martins also love artificial cavities. And in fact, they uh, now exclusively use um, uh, the uh, artificial cavities host. Uh, and uh, if you want to attract them, it's relatively easy to do depending on where you are and if you have suitable habitat. Um, they really respond to um, broadcasting of the, the morning chatter. And they also seem to respond to decoys that are set up um, on the Purple Martin houses. So if you have the right habitat and you have suitable cavities, uh, you probably will be able to attract Purple Martins here in Florida. So historically, uh, Purple Martins would use natural cavities. And as I mentioned that the uh, Southwestern subspecies, they still use natural cavities. Um, and many of the Western Purple Martins use natural cavities as well. So these are cavities that have been excavated by woodpeckers. However, the Eastern Purple Martins don't do this anymore. Um, they in fact rely exclusively or almost exclusively on artificial housing. Uh, and in fact, the last recorded place that folks have seen uh, Purple Martins using natural cavities for nesting is at our own Orlando wetlands, which I think is super exciting. It's, it's right next door to us. And um, so I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end of my, my talk, but this is the, the big announcement that Rochelle was talking about that my students are working on organizing a project to um, basically um, survey the, the Orlando wetlands to determine whether there are still purple martins that are nesting there in natural cavities and they need your help. And so um, we would love to recruit anybody who might be interested in volunteering for this project. So again, I'll talk more about this at the end and I'll provide a link where you guys can go uh, to get more information on that. So Purple Martins here on the East Coast, they actually have a really long history with humans or relatively long uh, history with humans. And so humans have actually been putting out nesting uh, or housing for these birds for quite some time. And there's in fact evidence that uh, Native Americans put out natural gourds, which you'll still see in some places, uh, natural gourds used as housing for Purple Martins. And so uh, the, the earliest evidence that has been recorded was uh, from the early 1800s, uh, where it was documented that Chickasaw and the Choctaw people were putting out the gourds to uh, attract purple martins. So the question is then why were folks doing this so early? Why were they attracting martins? And so it's possible that uh, they were doing this for uh, natural agricultural pest management. Um, although it turns out that 
purple martins don't actually eat a lot of mosquitoes, uh, which here in Florida, we certainly as uh, human hosts <laughs> uh, are worried about mosquitoes. Uh, but there are a lot of other types of insect pests that purple martins could uh, could help us with. Uh, and then there are other type of non-insect pests. And I do realize this is not a purple martin, this is an oriole <laughs> that is mobbing uh, a corvid here. Um, but purple martins will, will also do that. And so it is possible that maybe they were, that the Native Americans were attracting these martins um, for that reason. Or it could simply be that the Native Americans also enjoyed birding and bird watching and attracting uh, birds to, to their um, villages. Uh, and we know because we're all here because of Audubon <laughs> and uh, our mutual love for bird watching and uh, nature. And of course, there are people all over the United States that love the Purple Martin. And every year there are lots of festivals held in honor of the Purple Martin. So why not? Uh, why is why couldn't it be the case that the Native Americans were also um, just appreciating uh, these birds for, for what they are? So this appreciation uh, for the purple martin has been around for quite some time and it has gotten uh, to be a pretty big thing. <laughs> and it's turned into a really big community-based science or citizen science project across North America. And so there are <coughs> thousands, if not tens of thousands of purple martin land landlords in the United States and Canada that provide these nesting sites and, and maintain them for Purple Martins. And uh, the sort of the central hub that connects a lot of these folks is the Purple Martin Conservation Association. And uh, the Purple Martin Conservation Association provides, or the PMCA, uh, provides lots of information if you're interested in becoming a Purple Martin landlord. They also have several community-based science projects ongoing that you can participate in, um, monitoring when Purple Martins are coming and going. Um, and if you have a, a Purple Martin nest site like this, monitoring uh, how many eggs are laid, how long the incubation period is, uh, fledgling success, and so on. So the PMCA has been collecting data now for over 25 years and, and have over a million nest records during that time, which I think is pretty impressive. Uh, and everyone is welcome to participate. So if this is something that is of interest to you, I definitely recommend you checking out the PMCA uh, website for more information. So the Purple Martins here in Florida, they start arriving uh, in late December, early January, uh, and uh, will continue coming in um, in February. They're right now flying around and uh, looking for different places to, um, to nest. And um, then they head out, of course, when they're done in the summer and into the fall. How do we know this? Uh, again, going back to citizen science is a really big uh, component to our knowledge about um, both spring and fall migration when the birds are arriving. So I'm sure many of you participate in eBird. So lots of information is gained from eBird. And then also the PMCA uh, has their own projects too for uh, monitoring uh, Martin arrivals and departures. So one of these citizen science projects that the uh, PMCA hosts is the scout arrival study. So every year folks are out looking for when these birds are arriving. And again, lots and lots of reports coming in to the PMCA. Just last year, over 3000 reports were submitted to the PMCA, which I think is really impressive. However, I just wanted to <laughs> narrow in here on Central Florida uh, and show that Although we have definitely reports coming in, it's a little patchy. <laughs> and so um, I definitely encourage those of you who are out on a regular basis for um, bird watching, if you see a purple martin in the springtime, to definitely report that to PMCA so that we can uh, fill in some of these areas here. 
So those are all observational studies that everyone can participate in, but there are of course other ways that we can find out uh, when and where the purple martins are moving. And one of those ways is by uh, putting trackers, uh, so GPS trackers or radio telemetry trackers to see um, the exact routes that the birds are using and when they are moving. So um, those are really important types of studies too. And we're gonna come back to this later in the talk too, because um, we are in the process of, of doing some of this at UCF as well. So let me sh shift gears a little bit here and introduce you to my lab. Um, I have a great group of undergraduate students that work with me. And in fact, I have a couple folks that have now graduated but are, that are still working with me. Um, and some of these you may recognize um, because the U UCF has actually started their own chapter of the Audubon Society. We're called the Night Hawks, and I am their faculty advisor. Uh, Lauren Puleo is one of my students, and she is currently the president uh, of Night Hawk. Uh, Julia uh, was the founding uh, vice president, and then Stephanie over here. She was also she was the founding president of Night Hawks, and she is the current president of the. Kissimmee Valley uh, Audubon Society. So all three of these ladies um, study birds in my lab, um, as does Il Isabel. And she's working on um, the Scrub Jay project that I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. And Brian is also a founding member of the Nighthawk Audubon Society, and he has since graduated. He's still working for Audubon and does surveys all over the place. Um, so he's definitely still involved um, with birding to a high degree. Uh, Christine is uh, the original member of my lab, although she doesn't actually study birds. Uh, she's the student I talked about earlier uh, who works on um, understanding diet composition in sea turtles. And then Victoria is a former student, a pre-vet student who does something completely different. She uh, was looking at uh, characterizing the microbiome in mealworms. So it turns out that mealworms can eat uh, polystyrene. And so she has been working on, on looking at how the microbiome affects that ability. Oh, and we're getting Zoom bombed by a cat. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the the joys of um, COVID COVID times. So, all of these students have been involved in the establishment of the UCF Purple Martin project, which is a big project that we kicked off just around this time last year, and so we have now established. 12 uh, Purple Martin houses around the campus uh, at UCF. And we have a total of 144 plastic gourds um, for them. So we um, set these houses up at this time last year. And then we all headed off for spring break, hoping that when we returned that the birds would have gotten here. Um, <clears throat> uh, but before we did so, uh, we um, we spent quite a bit of time in the field just getting these houses set up, right? And so they have to be very secure. So they're actually cemented into the ground. And then um, there's this pole. Uh, the pole that we have on campus is 16 foot tall. The Purple Martins prefer for it to be anywhere between 12 and 20 feet tall up in the air. It's really important that these birds are protected from um, predators. And so we've set these, uh, that Brian is setting up here, uh, a predator guard on each pole to prevent um, primarily snakes, but also raccoons and other things from climbing. It prevents the climbers from getting up to um, those gourds. <laughs> On these poles, we also have um, the carriage, so the or the gourd rack here that actually moves up and down. We have a winch system that you see at the bottom that we crank a hand crank to crank that carriage with all the cords up to the top of the pole. So here you can see Lauren is now cranking up the carriage. Uh, this particular house has 18 gourds on it. And so I, I mentioned that we have 12 houses distributed across campus. One of the projects that we're, we're doing is looking at uh, 
preference of purple martins for cavity density. And so at half of those houses, um, we provided six gourds and at the other half of the houses we prefer, we've provided 18 gourds. And so we're gonna maintain this configuration for the next couple of years and document um, the use of those different houses to see if we can, um, if we can determine if birds are preferring either high density or low density houses. Of course, 2020 was our first season, so uh, I'm very happy that we were attract, able to attract any birds, um, but it was definitely a very small sample size. So we'll keep this for going for a couple years, um, and then maybe we'll move gourds around to provide more cavities at, at all of the sites. So we finished this up, as I mentioned earlier, uh, just before um, spring break, and we all headed off in our separate directions and waited for those, uh, those Martins to find us. And in fact, they did, uh, but unfortunately so did COVID. And so the students actually didn't come back after spring break and, and the campus closed down. Um, so our, whole, our whole, whole field season was put on hold, um, but the, the birds didn't stop. <laughs> so they kept going. I actually live very close to campus. So I was able to go to campus on a regular basis to check them out. And we ended up having 12 nesting pairs, which I think is super exciting since we didn't know whether we were going to get any birds at all. So 12 nesting pairs and a total of 50 fledglings. So um, that was super exciting. So as I said, my, my students weren't able to come out and work with me, uh, but instead my eight-year-old son uh, served as a field assistant. Um, so he, he did all of the hand cranking. Uh, <laughs> And I was very good at checking out the, the gourds as well. But I am very excited now for 2021 where my students will be able to come out as well. Luckily though, everybody was involved with the actual setup of the, of the houses. And so um, actually UCF did a story on us and uh, the Purple Martin uh, Conservation Association ran that in their spring issue. So we actually made the cover, which I think was really excited, exciting for all of us. So now that we have those houses established at UCF and we have been able to attract birds and they're already back now for the 2021 season, uh, now we can actually start the work of conducting the research um, to understand the ecology and behavior of these birds. And the, you already know from earlier in my talk, I'm really interested in health and disease and uh, the microbiome, but I'm also really interested in other components of, of bird ecology, such as foraging and uh, foraging ecology, um, mate choice behavior, going back to those house friends, um, movement ecology and migration, of course, uh, conservation, and then the genetic and genomics that kind of underlie everything. So I don't have time to talk about all of those things today. Uh, so I am going to focus on talking a little bit about our work into foraging ecology because it's the portion um, uh, of this research that we've gotten the farthest with for the Purple Martins and I actually have some, some results to share with you. So what we've been doing is trying to understand what the birds are eating. So characterizing the composition of the diet, just like my student Christine has been doing with, uh, with her sea turtles. And so for this, we collect uh, bird poop. Uh, what's great about fecal samples is that they're easy to collect, especially from nestlings. As soon as you pick them up, they uh, very happily provide a sample. <laughs> so it's easy to collect and uh, easy to store and easy to process. <laughs> Another cat. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so in our lab, we study a lot of poop, whether it's from sea turtles or from, from birds. But what we're trying to do is to characterize the composition, whether it be the diet or the microbiome. So I will give you an example here. And yes, I am completely aware that this is not a purple martin, um, but it will demonstrate uh, anyhow what we're, what we're doing. So a chicken is out in the yard and uh, eating some bugs and other things, uh, of course goes through the system and ends up on the other side. So we collect these samples and we uh, extract DNA from those samples and uh, then basically do fecal forensics. And so 
that DNA is mostly intact and it comes from those insects and other components of the diet. And we can sequence that DNA and figure out what the birds have been eating. I'm just gonna step away for one second and let the cat out so he will not be meowing. Come on. There you go. There you go. It's mm -hmm. only in an Audubon meeting where you can get excited about spending your Friday night looking at fecal <laughs> forensics. <laughs> All right, I'm back. <laughs> and I will just say here too, we have two cats and they are both indoor cats. So they are not bird eating cats, <laughs> but they are very, very much Zoom bombers. So, <laughs> All right. So coming back to the fecal forensics here. So we have been con conducting fecal forensics in the Purple Martin to understand uh, the diet primarily, but there's DNA from lots of other things in that diet, including bacteria constituting that microbiome I've been talking about, but there's also DNA from parasites. So we can learn a lot about parasitic infections uh, and the health of these birds from all of that great DNA that we find in um, the fecal samples. So we've been conducting this particular project on um, diet and purple martins with a lot of other folks. And so I'm going to introduce you here. This is Joe Segris. He is the president of the Purple Martin Conservation Association. He's up in Erie, Pennsylvania, right here on the map. Uh, Brandon, uh, Brandon Honig is a PhD student up in uh, Pennsylvania, also at Duquesne. Uh, university. He is working on his PhD there with water thrushes, uh, specifically looking at their diet composition using these DNA-based techniques. Stephanie Gaspar, who again is the, the president of the Kissimmee Valley Audubon Society. She's a former student of mine, but she still uh, is very active in research in my group. Uh, Kevin Frazier is a professor up in Manitoba. Um, so uh, at this site up here. And then Jason Fisher, who is right here in Orlando uh, with Disney Conservation. And so we have partnered together to collect sample from these three different sites, Florida, uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, and Manitoba, uh, <coughs> to look at uh, what the Purple Martins e are eating and how that, that diet composition varies across those sites. So those samples were collected in 2019. We had about 150 samples collected in total. And the ones from Manitoba and from Pennsylvania were sent down to UCF. And I drove over to Disney to pick up the, the ones here in Orlando. And in fact, I was there for the collection of most of those samples. We brought them back to UCF and uh, Stephanie, uh, was involved with the processing and the DNA extractions for these samples. And then we actually have a DNA sequencer at UCF now, which is super exciting. So we were able to do all of this work at UCF with a lot of student power. So um, we did this sequencing in the fall. Um, so I actually have data to share with you, which is super exciting, but I thought it might be more exciting to show it in pictorial form. So instead of giving you a long list of insects, I'm, I'm gonna show you some pictures instead. And I am by no means an entomologist. <laughs> and so uh, unfortunately I cannot answer very specific questions about these uh, insects. I can just tell you uh, what insects the birds are eating. So as you can see here, it's a lot of different types of moths, uh, a lot of crane fruit flies, a lot of midges. Again, two more moths here. <coughs> we picked up a couple ants, um, more midges here, uh, actually an aphid or a couple aphids that um, was maybe a little bit surprising. Again, these birds are feeding, feeding on the wing mostly. And of course here are these dragonflies that the Purple Martins are known for, uh, damselflies and, and also some types of beetles. Uh, more uh, different types of flies and, and beetles and another dragonfly here at the end. So this is my one figure that I, I'm going to show you guys and I'll walk you through it. Um, hopefully it's not too confusing here, but uh, this is data uh, from the three different sites, uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, Orlando, and then Winnipeg up in Manitoba. 
And what I'm showing on this axis here are the different prey orders. So these are the different orders of insects that we detected at those three different sites from the fecal samples of the, of the purple martins. And what I've done is defined, again, I'm not an entomologist, and so I have defined what those uh, prey orders actually refer to here on the right hand side. And so what we're showing, the size of the bar uh, tells you that frequency of occurrence from zero to one. So these are percentages, right? So uh, diptera, for example, in Orlando occurred in 75% of all of the fecal samples that we looked at. So the frequency of occurrence uh, corresponds to the percentage of all of the samples that were looked at in that particular site that we found say flies in or um, uh, odonata, the, the dragonflies and damsel flies. So here we can start seeing some interesting patterns. Um, we can see that at all three sites, the flies or the diptera was uh, the most common, uh, so represented in, in the largest number of samples. Um, we can also see some, uh, uh, some clear differences across the sites. So interestingly, the caddis flies were only picked up in Winnipeg, um, but we did not pick up any in Orlando or Erie. Uh, and don't worry about the different colors here of the bars, just look at the full, the full bar in, in total. Um, some other uh, interesting uh, observations, the Hymenoptera, so the bees, ants, and wasps, we didn't have any of that in Erie, uh, whereas we picked up quite a bit in Orlando, not, not as much in Winnipeg. Um, so there are definitely some really interesting patterns coming out of this. Um, so one of the interesting things too is in Orlando, we picked up, uh, in two samples, we picked up ticks. Uh, and so, we don't know if the birds were actually hunting these ticks or if maybe these were ticks that they were picking off of themselves and then consuming. Um, <clears throat> which brings up a, a, another interesting point to talk about with these types of DNA based techniques is that um, we can detect the, the different uh, insect species in the feces. However, we can't determine whether it was the bird that ate the insect or it was the bird that ate an insect that ate another insect. So that tick, for example, may have been, or maybe one of the aphids, which is even smaller, had uh, been consumed by another uh, predatory uh, insect for like a dragonfly, for example. And then we're picking it up in the purple martin, not because the purple martin ate the aphid directly, but because the, um, the purple martin ate the dragonfly that ate the aphid. So lots of interesting dynamics going on, uh, but I'm excited to be able to share these, uh, these data with you because they are hot off the press. <laughs> so the diet study is our first big one that we've been doing uh, with the UCF Purple Martin Project, but we have lots of other things planned going forward. And so one of those projects is using radio telemetry uh, to look at bird movement within the site, but also migratory movement. And so my undergraduate student, Lauren Puleo, uh, she is very interested in uh, migration of birds and, and specifically how migratory behavior is changing with climate change. And so this is her last semester at UCF. She's graduating in the spring and then she's actually heading off to South Carolina for graduate school, which is really exciting. But before she leaves, she's going to uh, help the UCF um, Purple Martin Project to establish a MODIS tower on campus. Uh, this radio telemetry tower will allow us to monitor birds that we put these radio telemetry tags on. <coughs> So the MODIS project is really exciting because it's, it's a huge network of these radio telemetry towers um, that are hosted by um, various folks, uh, not just here in the United States, but actually across the world. And um, so there are over 950 of these MODIS towers. In fact, at this point, there's probably over a thousand. Um, last time I looked, um, it was at 950 lots of different species and in fact these radio telemetry tags are so small now so miniaturized that um, some folks are even putting them on insects and tracking insect movement which i think is is wonderful uh, here we can see some of the 
the sites here in Florida, it's great when you see a belt like this of sites because then birds that are migrating this way or moving this way, you can um, hopefully catch them as they're moving across the, this belt of sites. But again, it's kind of um, sparse here in our area. And so we're super excited about getting one of these towers installed at UCF so that we can um, monitor these birds. And of course, these towers are not only going to pick up the signals from the tags that we put on the Purple Martins, but um, our tower will contribute to the larger MODIS network by picking up signals from other birds or insects that happen to be flying by in that range. So that's going to be really neat going forward. <clears throat> Another project that we're working on, which we're starting now this, this uh, field season, is looking at ectoparasites. So there are lots of ectoparasites that uh, affect purple martins and other cavity nesting birds and non-cavity nesting birds. Uh, and so we are really interested in understanding what that diversity looks like. Um, not just of the ectoparasites, but also of the endoparasites, and how uh, if there's a relationship between the two in um, prevalence and abundance. And we're really interested in understanding the effects of mites specifically on purple martins. So purple martins uh, tend to uh, have very large populations of these uh, blood-sucking mites. And it's something that is, that's discussed quite a bit in the Purple Martin landlording community <clears throat> about how to mitigate these mites and whether they should be mitigated. And so that's what we're hoping to be able to contribute uh, information to that discussion um, to understand how these mites are actually affecting the health and reproductive success of these birds. And um, also what happens when you try to reduce those, um, uh, those ectoparasite loads. And I think it's, I don't know, most people would logically feel like um, reducing ectoparasite loads is a good thing for the birds, but it turns out that, that the answer isn't actually that straightforward. And there was a recent study that was published just last year uh, from a woman up in New York where she had moved uh, a nesting, old nesting material out and uh, so the nest swapping basically to replace uh, nesting material with fresh nesting material to try to reduce the ectoparasite loads. And what she found was that one, the mites came back very, very quickly. Those populations were reestablished very quickly. And also that <clears throat> temporary reduction of um, parasite load didn't actually have uh, large effects on reproductive success or health of these birds. And so it probably is uh, more effort than it's worth to try to reduce these mite populations. Again, these mites have been, um, they have a relationship with these birds that have developed over a long period of time. So that's one of the projects we're working uh, on. My student, Julia uh, Janeko, uh, has been doing some insect identification. So she's going to be working on that, uh, identifying the ectoparasites in the nests visually. And then Isabel in my lab, she uh, actually worked at the, uh, she was an intern at the Audubon um, Center for Birds of and so she's become a specialist on uh, reading blood slides and uh, looking for parasites in blood samples. So she's going to be working with me on that this, this spring. Another exciting project that we had, kind of a side project here this fall, uh, was a collaboration with the UCF Arboretum students. And so they've actually been growing purple martin gourds um, that folks are using to, to make these natural um, houses. So we thought that this was maybe a fun project to do, especially now during COVID times where a lot of students aren't on campus. Um, and it's a way to, to, to bring folks together. So. Here's the big one. I know Rochelle has been talking about this. <laughs> so uh, one thing that my students are working on right now is trying to organize an effort to look for um, natural cavity nesting at Orlando Wetlands Park. And I know there are a lot of folks that go out there on a regular basis to go bird watching. Um, and I, uh, I understand too that there are several of the volunteers over there that already have been looking for purple martins. So we're really excited about getting people together, 
uh, and having a more of an organized um, uh, an organized group of uh, surveyors to see if we can find evidence of, of these purple martins using the wetlands still. And so we've set up a web page that's up and running now. This is the, uh, the link to it. I'll include it in the chat also after uh, afterwards so that you can reach this. And I'm sure Rochelle will, will share it with you too. You can even find it by just Googling Anna Forsman at UCF and you can get to my, um, my research page. And there's a link there that'll take you directly to this. So there's a little bit of information. Again, this is still a work in progress, um, but here you can get a little bit of information about what we're hoping to do. And then there's also a questionnaire that you can complete. So if you're interested in volunteering going forward, please fill out this questionnaire uh, with your contact information and your availabilities, and we will reach out to you um, as we're, we're pulling this project together. Um, we would love to have your help to get out there and, uh, and see if we can find uh, Purple Martins. So that's all I have for this evening. Uh, I'd love to take any questions that you might have about the Purple Martins or anything else that, uh, that I've been talking about. Sea turtles, frogs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Anna, that was wonderful, and it's always nice to get back into the lab here. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, let's see, I think we have two questions that came in on chat, and I see a couple of people have raised their hands. So for those of you who are on video, you can either physically raise your hand like this, and I'll get to you. Or for those of you who are familiar with the very bottom of your screen or top of the screen, depending on if you're a Mac or, or Windows person, hover over, and you're going to see something that says reactions. If you click on that and push the little hand up, then I'll know I'll, I'll, I'll get to you in just a second. Um, so let's first go to Susan. Susan has said that that looks really cool, what you in the lab. She wants to know if we can come to UCF, see the houses, and if so, can you give us some guidance on where they're located on campus? Yes, absolutely. You are more than welcome to come to UCF um, and drive through campus. I think that the houses are actually relatively obvious, <laughs> so I don't think you'll have a hard time finding them. We have four of them that are located right across the street from the arena. And uh, Rochelle, so I can send you this information afterwards. Um, I can even send you a map if you want um, where they're located. We already have birds that are actively checking out gourds at uh, the two houses that are, are close to the um, observation, the um, observatory. So even if you just on your GPS look up UCF um, observatory, I think it's called the Robinson uh, observatory that'll show up and and you can get directions uh, how to get to there and you will see as you pull in to go to the observatory you will see the houses on the right hand side uh, and and we had at least seven or eight birds over there the other day all right fantastic um so let's go to pat touchberry pat would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question yes uh i have two questions uh, number two, number one is uh, the parasites. Well, let me start with the um, the housing that you have there for the birds. Does that get cleaned out every season? Because the, yeah, because those parasites would stay there, would they not? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of the the hematophagus or the blood sucking parasites will disappear once the birds are gone because the food's gone. Right. Uh, but in fact, some of these uh, parasites will overwinter in, in the nest boxes or the gourds uh, until the birds return the next year. So, but we do take the gourds down in December and clean them out. We scrub them out really well uh, and put them back up and we put pine straw, fresh, clean pine straw. So the birds have some material to start with, but yes, it's, so they're cleaned out every year. Okay, that's good. I, I like that. I had another question. Oh, can we get, we could arrange that kind of thing at 100 Acre Hollows. Couldn't we uh, set up one of those, uh, you know, tees with all the boxes on it or all the boards? <laughs> Is it an easy thing to do? Just set them up, let them do their thing. Yes. So it's important to have the right habitat. And so they do not want to have trees anywhere close trees no are it's completely not treeless just about 
Yep, and that'll be perfect. Okay. Uh, if there's any water nearby, even better. But okay, not necessary. Not okay, necessary. thank you so much. So, and if you're interested in doing something like that, uh, feel free to contact me. You can send me an email and I'd be happy to help in any way that I can. Um, we got all of our uh, houses from the Purple Martin Conservation Association. You can actually order directly from them and they are super helpful. They have lots of different types of houses and for every type of budget. So you can get ones that actually have the winches or the actually the house that I have here at, ha at home does not have the winch. It's just, it's like a flagpole. And so it's just yeah. a rope that you pull up and down. So they have lots of different um, options and they're really great at helping you find the, the right setup. Well, like one of the other participants here, Susan, she mentioned that she's seen Purple Martins out there. And I have two. Uh, because when I work out there, you know, birds fly over, but this year, especially with all the swallows, I've seen a lot of purple martins. Great. Well, if you get it set up and you attract birds, let me know. And I'd be happy to uh, come out with my students and, and we can ban them. All right. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh oh, Rochelle, you're muted terribly sorry. <laughs> um, thanks for the question, Pat, and, and Anna, for your perspective. 100 Acre Hollows is a 114 acre reclaimed um, abandoned waste management system, waste treatment facility. Mm -hmm. So it's got six wonderful cells and it's 114 acres and it's where we host our Audubon native plant garden. Mm -hmm. So um, it is a great study area. It's where most of us, follow, many of us volunteer and spend time out there. So we will connect back with you about the possibility of that and think about whether or not we can find some funding to do that. So, um, and I saw Rob had his hand up. Rob, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, I, I read an article sometime in the last few years that indicated that um, in various parts of the world, uh, insect populations were in pretty sharp decline. And I was just wondering if you were aware of this being the case for any of the insects that are food sources for the purple martins. Yeah, so the insect, there's evidence that insects all across the world, as you mentioned, are, are declining across the board, across taxa. Um, and so this is definitely something that is going to be an, is already an issue and is going to continue being an issue for purple martins since they're exclusively um, insectivores. So um, absolutely, that is something that we're really, really concerned about. And uh, I work, I, so I collaborate with the folks that I showed you pictures of earlier for the diet study. And all, all of us are part of the um, International Purple Martin Working Group. And we have um, colleagues that we meet with every Friday over Zoom down in Brazil, uh, where the birds spend the winter time. And this is definitely one of the topics that comes up a lot is, is thinking about these insect declines and how it's affecting the birds. Um, Another topic, of course, are uh, insecticides that are used in the environment, not only uh, affecting the food source for the birds, but may also be accumulating in the tissues of these birds because they're consuming those insects that have ingested the insecticides. So yeah, there are a lot of things that purple martins have to deal with. Um, right now, actually, we're having mass mortality in purple martins in Texas and the southern states that have now been hit with this um, the really, really cold weather. So I follow the, the Purple Martin um, group on Facebook, and it's just been really sad to see over this last week just you know, dozens, hundreds of birds that are dying. Um, actually, not necessarily from the cold directly, so they're not freezing to death. They're starving to death because the insects aren't flying, and so the birds don't have anything to eat. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a tough life being a <laughs> being a, a swallow for sure. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for your question, Rob. Um, Ann Hicks has made a comment um, in North Carolina. She said she used to go to the Old Man's Harbor Bridge to watch 100,000 purple martins roost in late July. And she asked, is there a roosting site such as that in Florida to make that observation? And when do purple martins start migration in Florida? I know you covered that earlier, but if you could emphasize the, the migration cycle for that when they would be coming and going through Florida again. 
Yeah. So yes, we definitely have large roosts in Florida. And I wish that I had my buddy Jason Fisher on the line here from Disney because he is definitely the purple martin expert and he can could tell you where some of those roosts are unfortunately i don't actually know or those locations are and they my understanding is that they do move also um and so i think the purple martins will start leaving the area shortly after um uh, after breeding. And so I remember from the summer when we were having our weekly meetings and chatting with the folks down in Brazil that they were already starting to see them down there in August. Fantastic. And Anna, what I might ask you then is whether or not you'd be willing to get in touch with your Disney buddy and perhaps give us an update that I could share out in the discussion thread um, for this event so that if we could maybe go check out some of those sites if, if he could provide us some input. Absolutely. I will check for you. Okay. Thank you. All right. So let me see. I'm just looking. Lydia and Ken, you're moving around a bit. Were you raising your hand or did you have a question? Or welcome, by the way, we didn't get to see you guys earlier. Did you guys want to ask a question? If so, you want to take yourself off mute? You're still on mute. So no, okay, we didn't there we have go. Question. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I could tell if you were waving or if you just kind of moving around there, getting things going. Well, lovely to see you guys. All right, let me just check and see if anyone else. Oh, Bert has a question. Bert, over to you. Yeah, well, Pat took uh, my, my main question about 100 acre hollows, but along that lines, I know out at Orlando Wetlands Park, they put up a chimney swift tower and just hopefully attract chimney swifts, and they never we're fortunate enough to have them uh, come out there. What is the uh, su success ratio that you know of in putting up the houses and then actually having Purple Martin show up? Because uh, if we put this up at, at 100 Acre Hollows, we've got four bat boxes and an owl box out there that um, are serving other purposes, but they're <laughs> not uh, serving bats and owls. Well, I wish that I could answer that question. Um, I truly don't know. I, I've been told that we've been super lucky here at UCF to have already gotten the 12 pairs the first year. Um, I'll tell you, I we put up a, uh, a house here in our backyard just last weekend. And uh, we put up the speaker to broadcast the calls. And within five minutes of putting the speaker up, we had at least 13 Purple Martins circling overhead. Um, we left those speakers up. We've had poor weather um, here, so uh, the birds haven't really been around. I put the speaker back up today and it took about an hour and a half. And then I had an after second year male that came and landed on the house and was checking out the gourds. Uh, he left and come, came back with four other birds uh, about a half an hour later. So I think that's unusual. <laughs> uh, I was talking uh, to Joe, um, the, the president of the Purple Martin uh, Conservation Association, and he said there are people and uh, folks in, in areas that have tried for 13 years and haven't been able to attract birds. So I think it really depends on where you are. Uh, there are quite a few purple martins here in Florida. And so I think if you have the right habitat and you say put out some of these decoys and, and broadcast, to use one of these little speakers to broadcast the calls, I think you have a pretty good chance. Again, if you have, um, uh, if you're too close to trees and shrubs, that's gonna be a problem. But if you have a nice open habitat, um, I think the chances are pretty high that you'll you'll be able to attract some birds. But I can't make yeah. I can't make any guarantees. <laughs> like, like everything in nature, right? <laughs> you can talk about probabilities. <laughs> um, so Nancy Joe has shared a comment. She was saying that there's an, there are some of some purple martins around the golf courses in Sun Tree. Um, Nancy, did you want to come off mute and add anything else to that? Um, no, but there are walking paths around the, uh, some of the golf courses and there are at least three um, of the housing hotels for them around and they haven't yet come to uh, Sundry yet. Okay. Just so you know. Yeah. So uh, who is managing? Is there? I don't know. I think in one situation, I think it could be the people that live in one of the homes and then the other two situations they are by the water. So I think it might be the golf course. I could find out perhaps. 
Yeah. I mean, if you're, you're interested, then um, I think that putting up some speakers now is like the perfect time. Yeah. They come every year. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. So, I will. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I appreciate you're you. You're welcome. Adding that in. Um, all right, let me just take another quick look around before I switch screens. Does anybody else who, a lot of people look intrigued? Wendy looks particularly intrigued, like, that's fascinating. Look at all that bug stuff. <laughs> Did anyone else want to ask, ask a question or perhaps make a comment before we switch? Because Wendy does. See, I knew, Wendy, I talked you into it. So take yourself off mute and go ahead and ask your question. Really, it's, it's um, I'm a snowbird. And up north, I have a nice open area and I have a lot of native nesting birds that just, I have not had to put up houses for. I've seen several um, Purple Martin houses, hotels, Mm -hmm. but I've not ever tried it. Um, Is it, do you know if the summer is a better nesting time up there and then winter down here? So they're not here in the winter time. They're, they leave Florida spring. To, they're all in South America. Yeah, exactly. But they, they certainly get started much earlier down here in Florida. So now is the time that they're prospecting. They're flying around, checking out all the, the potential nest sites. Um, they may even be starting to you know, um, build a little bit. Uh, they're already shaping the, the pine straw that we put into the, the gourds on campus. So they're getting ready, but they probably won't start laying eggs for another two, three, four weeks um the earliest ones and then it'll they'll continue um they gen- generally only have one brood so when they're done and they're, they're okay uh, that was my other question how many because up north the birds that i have will have multiple yeah it just, it's constant. yeah it, it depends on on the birds so for my phd i worked on tree swallows up in, in the finger lakes area and mm-hmm. um during the time that I was there, I think I had one at one nest box, they had two broods, otherwise they were just single brooded. But then out in California, it is common for the tree swallows there and they get started so much earlier and they will generally have two broods. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Wendy. Um, so I'll ask one last question since I don't see anybody else raising their hand before we flip over. Um, when you were saying you want no trees nearby, like, can you give any kind of guidance on how, how far away? Um, that would be great to sort of indicate, like, do you need, like, half an acre before there's a tree? No. Or what does that look like? So 20, 25 feet. Uh, 40, 45 feet is even better. Okay. But at least 20 feet. All right. So th- thank you very much for that. Any, any other questions that I missed? Um, if not, let's all please give a round of applause this way or via the reactions to Anna for the wonderful presentation tonight. Thank you so much. Yay. Yeah, and yeah. even better that you heard it here first at <laughs> Space Coast Audubon about this wonderful opportunity. Thank so, you. Um, I did put that in the chat window and Anna, while I'm making my last couple of announcements, make sure I type that in all correctly. That would be great. Um, but please, please, please do two things. We, you know, one thing that we, we always love is contributing to citizen science data or contributing just to science as a whole. So um, if you'd like to be involved in this study, and one thing, Anna, maybe you should hit on this because we talked about this a little bit, given that it's the COVID time. I understand from our discussion that when you were saying gathering, that you're going to provide some opportunities where people could just go out as individuals or them and their um, social pod buddy but also um, the other gatherings would mean t- small groups, six or eight people would go. Did I catch it all correctly from when we discussed so this earlier? We, we will not be organizing any group events. And so that would be self-organized. So if folks would prefer to go out as groups, you're more than welcome to do so. And so what we will provide is guidance on uh, sites in the wetlands that we think are um, particular particularly potential for for as nest sites and hoping that people will go there and we'll also provide data forms and, and instructions uh, so that everybody is monitoring and, and, and collecting all the, the necessary data in, in a standardized way. But otherwise schedule and um, 
uh, how you want to coordinate that is up to individuals. You can go by yourself or you can self-organize into smaller groups or uh, whatever you feel comfortable with. But we won't, uh, especially now with COVID, it's, we won't be leading any sort of tours or anything like that as part of this. Okay, thank you so much. And yeah. Anne and I were talking about before that we have a couple of volunteers that pre-COVID used to volunteer every week at the um, wetlands. And I know most of us go out there regularly. And as Bert mentioned earlier, we have a field trip coming up. So if you'd like to participate, please don't feel, feel be aware that you can do this individually. We will encourage some, um, some activity where we'll say we're going out there on Friday who wants to join with the same protocol rules that we have in place for the field trips, that it would definitely be less than 10 people. And we'd be following all the regular prot protocols as far as mask and everything else. But this is something Thing. If you're not yet comfortable getting out in groups or in some of the weather ways that were that are going on, this is something that you could still do because you can do it as an individual. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that was shared with everyone. Yeah. So so let's have a prize. Let's, you know this is this is way enough fun to have on a Friday night talking about fecal forensics, <laughs> forensics and everything else, and getting into some good old bugs. But to add to that, let's have a prize and er, tell us about who might win this prize. Oh, you're still on mute, Bert. Sorry. <laughs> I could read lips a little bit, but there you go. <laughs> okay, I'm on now. <clears throat> um, before we get into the prize, because we are talking about uh, citizen or community science, for 100 Acre Hollows at the end of March, March 27th, I'm working on a planning sheet for doing a bio blitz. So if anyone's interested in doing that, um, we're going to uh, I've got an iNaturalist project set up, and so get ready to be looking for your meetup. I'll be posting that in meetup and and uh, in Anna. If, if any of your you or your students want to come and do do that, you know we could love to have scientists actually. Uh, awesome! Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm be more than happy to share that information here at UCF. We have several student organizations uh, of various kinds that I think they would be interested. And I've gone birding with the Nighthawk, so. It's... Excellent. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. Uh, and I think I, I, I even saw, I think that uh, Stephanie is on the call here somewhere too, or she, at least she was. She yeah, is. she joined a little way through uh, and I sent her a little welcome. So I'm like, look, Stephanie's here. Yay. So Stephanie, <laughs> you were famous earlier and even more famous now. Do you want to take yourself off mute and say hi, Stephanie? Oh, she said hi in the chat. Okay. All right. Oh, good. Well, hi to you. All right. All right. Bert, let's, let me just carry, have you carry on. Whoops. Sorry about that. Okay. So I got a quick question, Rochelle. Is Elena Bukowski or Michelle Moore on? Uh, I did not say either one of them. Let me go back to gallery view just to double check. I... No, I don't see either of them. Okay. So I, I made this contest a little bit tougher. You actually had to to read my meetup, follow the directions, and come to this meeting. And only one person has completed all of those requirements, and that was Glenn Turner. So Yay, Glenn! Woohoo! Look at you, you superstar. <laughs> so, Glenn, uh, send, send me your address. The email, my email address is uh, right there. Yeah, uh, I'll send you an email with mine. Thanks. Thanks, Bert. That's great. And that's uh, two, two tickets to the, to the Brevard Zoo, and you have to use them before, I think it's July. So uh, I'll, I'll send you that info. We can do that. Fantastic. We can shot twice, so we should be able to go. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. And a huge thank you to Bert and Val for donating those tickets. Um, yeah, thank and, you, Bert. Always keeping us in, in, in good connection and good partnership with the zoo. So thank you so much for that. Um, okay, well, that is all for our presentation tonight. Um, I just wanted to say, um, have fun for those of you who did clear the wait list and make some of the upcoming meetings, uh, or sorry, the upcoming field trips. Um, I also wanted to remind you, just as Bert mentioned, that do check first thing in the morning. We're going to have a little drop in temperature, and what that often means is a drop in birders. So sometimes they'll go early in the morning. I got lucky the last time, I think, where someone, you know, canceled like eight o'clock, and I was able 
able to get out because I cleared the wait list. So be sure to check, even if you didn't already clear for, for the ones for this weekend, then please be sure to check that. Um, and to help Anna, besides doing the survey, um, you did notice that she had a slide there talking about the way in which Purple Martin Conservation Association also uses in eBird data, it's another way. So um, you've learned a few things now. So when you record those purple martins in your eBird data, then I will also ask or challenge you to perhaps add something else that you learn, which would be some things about the slide that showed what year that bird might be, whether it was a natural cavity, what kind of nest did you see it in or coming from, that type of thing. Um, so anything else like that will be just one more way that we can contribute when we're already out birding and using eBird. Um, so on that note, it's been my absolute pleasure to have all of you. I want to thank uh, the special thanks to Anna and her entire lab team. And then also I need to take a chance to thank Megan, who works all the magic in the background, let you all in, let it just flow along as I was going and, and talking. So thanks, Megan, for providing our technical support. I hope to see you all again next month when we travel to Peru together, which will be an absolute blast. And in between, I hope that you have fun out on the trails. Be safe and happy birding. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Glenn. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.